So that's how we see it. So it's it comes into the question of kale versus sweet potato leaves, right? But nowadays we have locally grown kale, just as we have locally grown sweet potato leaves. Um, so where do you make those choices? What is right? What is sustainable? What is regenerative farming? How do you get your plates to be more diverse? How do you have it resonate uh, with tradition and culture? So these are what our series is going to explore. Today, we have some amazing panelists. Uh, you know, all of them have multi-talents. So there's no way I'm going to be able to introduce them all. So please follow them on Instagram uh, to see more of what they do. So we have Stuart, um, the founder of Alaska Life. He's an investment banker turned urban farmer. Um, with Alaska Life, I feel it's very much about decentralized, high-tech urban farming making uh, farming something that's kind of something every one of us can do, right? From small communities to individuals, if you have a unit of Alaska Life, you could grow some plants with ease uh, for yourself and your family. Um, and then we have Hui Ying, who is currently a doctoral student of anthropology. Uh, she's not in Singapore at present, but her work focuses on Southeast Asia. Um, she's also the co founder about community gardens, what people grow, what people eat, and how we can connect those dots. Uh, which is currently ongoing. Uh, soil is very important, uh, and, and we don't talk about how important is the person to reach out for that. Then we have Dr. Wilson. Uh, he teaches at NUS, but he's also full-time at NPARCS. He's the deputy director of operations at Jurong Lake Gardens. Uh, but on a personal note, uh, and his Instagram feed is full of interesting plants that you would be inspired to grow at home as well um, to eat. And then we have is a company that's 13 years old. Uh, before that, he's had many adventures. Uh, he's got a background in botany from NUS. He doesn't say when he graduated, but you know we all kind of know it's a long time ago. <laughs> um, but he's uh, always innovating and he's done everything quite successfully, okay, actually very successfully from container farming to um, kind of landscaping. And right now to creating, uh, I think something that he's better off saying it because he says it's a bio, bio cleanser with active plant uh, and microbes. So very relatable to where we're going with the pandemic as well, I guess. We all want clean air. Uh, so Vera is gonna share more about that at the end uh, as well. So, and then we have Tammy, who's going to be our moderator for this session. Uh, she identifies as an activist in process, um, but I think it's very much, she's someone this is my definition uh, and how I see it. And is that she's someone who's walking the talk um, about how impassioned she is about social change issues. And that's across food, society, diversity, um, and all of those very important themes to how we live. So Tammy, you can take over. Hi everyone. So thanks for joining us, um, everyone who's participating today and also the panelists. Um, I'm very excited for the talk um, that we are going to have and the conversations that are going to happen. Um, and I'm sure that they'll continue offline as well. Um, so briefly to take everyone through today's schedule, um, we're going to have Nithya, I think, saying a few things more about food sovereignty, if she is. If not, then I guess she's already covered it briefly. Um, and then uh, we're going to go into our panel discussion um, until about 9 p.m. And then at 9 p.m. we'll have a Q&A. Um, and for that, we will have a Slido link and a QR code, which you can uh, access in a bit, yes, right there. Um, so do share your questions with the Slido platform and then we'll answer it at 9 p.m., hopefully, if we get there in time. Um, and then after the Q&A, we will just kind of wrap up and share a bit more about what the panelists want to share. Um, yeah, so all of those administrative things aside, um, just a few reminders, if anyone would like to share some comments in the chat, you want to participate, um, feel free to just 
share whatever, respond to what the panelists are saying, or you know, just chime in. Um, but do keep yourself on mute for our panel discussion. Um, and then yeah, just insert any of the questions you have on Slido. Um, okay, so that was a bit of a long introduction. So I guess you can just jump straight into the panel discussion. Um, so I think we'll start very um, simply with um, the first question, which is uh, in simple layman terms, because I think we have a lot of participants here who are also not very familiar with the term. Um, how would you describe food sovereignty? Um, and it's a very big ask. I think it's a very big theory, um, a very big uh, concept also that requires quite a bit of knowledge to break down. So I do understand that um, might be a bit difficult for the panelists to do that, but um, to the best of your abilities, maybe anyone who feels comfortable just chiming in, um, we can just get along with the first question. Feel free to just jump in, whoever wants to start. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to call someone. <laughs> Why not you just do that? <laughs> <laughs> I see Vera has unmuted himself. So Vera, did you want to start? Oh, okay, I shall. <laughs> so I think most things about sovereignty, I think it's a lot to do with independence and wanting to have your own say about what you want to do and how you want to manage yourself. Uh, and I think that's what it takes off from here with regards to food sovereignty. I think we should be very clear that uh, food sovereignty is about the innate right for people to have some control over what they want to eat and what they want to what they want to grow and what they want to eat, and I think that is what I feel that is the definition of what it should be. But then that definition detracts from the realities of what the world has become, uh, because at the end of the day, with regards to how uh, the other different forces that actually then challenge this sovereignty, are uh, a bit more difficult to to define. Uh, with regards to if you were contextualizing it for Singapore, then it becomes a lot more very clear that, you know, food sovereignty is surrogated to the government, literally, right? So then food sovereignty is that you then give everything up uh, because you import 90% of our food, then basically there's no sovereignty for you to figure out what you want to grow and how you want to eat it and what you have with you. So there's a bit of a challenge of how you define food sovereignty in Singapore or with regards to not even in Singapore, but regionally as well. That's, that's my take on it. Right, that was a good starting point. Um, I'm actually curious to know um, a bit more. Okay, so for content I think for the participants, I'm also very new to the topic and I've not studied it um, academically or anything. So this is also equally as new for probably uh, me along with the other participants. So I wanted to ask a bit more about, so Vera mentioned a bit about the realities of the forces that challenge um, us being able to have control over what we grow and eat. So do any of the panelists want to share a bit more about what those forces look like? Um, yeah. Perhaps maybe I just add on. Um, the thing about it is that, I mean, unlike other countries where uh, you have space to grow food, right? Uh, Singapore, we are, are unique in our own ways because we are island city state, whereby there's a lack of space. And of course, due to our tropical weather, our homes are uh, in high rises, I'm referring to, and you know, it's not conducive for growing food. So that is probably something that that a lot of people who want to be to do so to grow some of their own things might not be able to 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 write, do it right at the doorstep uh, in their own comfort of their own homes right so that is something but of course um well where I work my organization promotes uh, community gardening allotment gardening and that is something that I would have to say that uh back in the old days when I'm still young when I'm wanting to grow my own things I don't have space but now um we are starting somewhere. And I would say that it is a good initiative um, and I would urge uh, the young to take up gardening so that you can grow your own food, uh, experience the process so that um, you understand how food is produced, how difficult it can be and don't take food for granted. Yeah, perhaps maybe the rest of the panelists can add on and then get the discussion going. 
Yeah, I guess if I just jump in real quick, um, in terms of, uh, at least from, from my perspective on food sovereignty, it's, it's, it's exactly what Vera said. I think the opposite side of it, or, or just to, um, um, just w- one of the components that I would add is that it, it's really about the stakeholders. So we're talking about consumers, producers, and distributors um, also having a, a meaningful say in how things are actually physically grown, so the process, and then the policies that guide um, how things are, are produced, consumed, and distributed. So it really is kind of a, a almost like a closed loop system where the stakeholders are also in charge of how things are regulated and how things are, are produced. And um, I would say again, like like uh, Wilson mentioned, um, and also Vera mentioned, so much food is imported uh, into Singapore that you know having that level of control over the mechanism and also the policy by which things are done, whether they're on the production side and saying, hey, we have to grow food uh, in parts of Africa and re-import it um, into Singapore, it's you know there's some challenge. Uh, to that, to that happening. Um, having said that, Singapore um, has consistently ranked one, like number one or number two in the world in the global food security index, which means that there's a lot of success in not only being able to secure the necessary uh, supply of the product, um, but then also being able to, if you look at the food food safety index, uh, Singapore also ranks in the top ten, which means that they're able to control some of the mechanisms that lead to healthier, safer, fresher produce uh, being always available in Singapore. Um, and so the part of the challenge is, is really um, to have full sovereignty. You'd imagine that it have to, you know, a lot of these activities have to happen on your own property. Um, but uh, what Singapore is really trying to do is try to um, really kind of augment their ability to do so by, by making smart investments internationally um, and then finding ways in which they can work with the right partners, whether they're partners from Japan or Australia for all over the world that allows them um, to be able to enforce some of the rules uh, that can lead to their citizens having access to high quality fresh produce year round. Um, sharing, I'm in a shared office, so I'm just gonna like speak a bit. But I would like to jump on what Stuart and also what Deirdre was saying. There are two like really important points, which is one is that Singapore is largely import oriented. So when it comes to thinking about food sovereignty, we have a different we have to take into consideration the fact that food sovereignty, as it's discussed in Singapore, is already going to lose the sense of the things that people who have been pushing for food sovereignty for many years, peasants, farmers, fishers, pastoralists, what they have been losing, which is connection with land, spiritual and cultural connection, um, and the actual ability to farm. So as people in an import-oriented space, I think one of the things that's really important to think about is what do those investments that Stuart was talking about do in changing the ecological or social spaces that that then produce the food that Singapore imports? And I think that in terms of what food security actually means, if we really take the ecological and the social in, we need to consider that much longer-term state, um, which is not just that you know, what comes to the plate is nutrient dense or like diverse in a certain way, but how is it produced in a different way? So the, the idea that we eat our landscapes is really true. And if we eat food that actually produces landscapes that comes from deforestation and comes from monocropped plantations, um, the forest fires and everything is just going to scale up in the next few years. And we're already seeing so much of that. So um, in a way, I think food sovereignty is becoming so important right now because it's entering urban spaces like through climate change in a way that you can't ignore. And those are the things we really, really have to think about. Uh, can I add on to what we Ying said? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's, it's a lot to do with what, you know, is one of the things that's come about is essentially, right, because everything is catered for, you walk to the supermarket, you just buy and go. And that's led to a, a, a culture of wastefulness as well. Uh, if you go back to 2019, uh, where they talked about the food wastage in Singapore, it's $2.5 billion of food that's wasted every year. So almost immediately then you start to look at the lens and say that actually we keep importing so much food that we actually over import most of the time and because we over import then there's no value proposition for what where the food comes from what the food means at all for anyone within the Singapore population because you walk into a hawker center you realize you throw away so much food everywhere is throwing food everyone's throwing food away so 
what Hui Ying said is true, right? Because the value proposition that's out there in terms of whether you know where your food comes from and whether you're throwing the food or you understand what, what it takes for a farmer to grow the food. And by the time it gets into your, onto your, onto your, onto your plate, and then you eat what, what is imported and what you buy, and then you realize you're throwing half that food away, the heartache and the pain that a farmer is, is, goes through to produce that food is not at all in the whole value chain at all with regards to food. So when you look at it, then, then what, what is it about food sovereignty? Singapore is a sovereign nation. We import our own sovereign food, but the individual sovereignty to food is not even there's no individual sovereignty to the food at all because people don't care. So then people don't exercise their right to understand what the sovereignty is. Yeah, so I would um, just add one point to that also, which is that exactly this thing about what do people know as sovereignty in their own decision making and also how that food is produced and what Vera was saying. And I think one of that points is sovereignty is not just about the production. It's also having the space to have a means of communicating with one another, to form a position of power and um, like a civic position of power from which to make these discussions and choices about how the food we want to eat also produces the landscapes that we want to live in as part of this much bigger world. So a lot of like very interesting insights already and a lot of ideas that um, I want to go into, but I can already imagine there's not enough time to go into all of them. Um, so to kind of just um, ground the discussion a little bit more, um, I wanted to bring out, I suppose, um, and ask what the panelists, you know, I think we're getting at it a little bit, but um, just for the purposes of this panel, I think it's worth asking whether the panelists yourselves feel that food sovereignty is a feasible and desirable goal in Singapore. Um, and we touched on it a little bit. We heard a little bit about um, the fact that Singapore is, you know, we are, we are constrained based on our land, based on the space that we have. Um, yeah, and also we heard a little bit from Hui Ying about um, reconnecting sort of citizens to their food. Um, a little bit from on that from Vera as well. Um, so it seems like the general consensus is that we agree that food sovereignty or some some version of it at least should be present in Singapore. Um, and so I'm wondering um, if any of the panelists have sort of reservations about agreeing with that as a feasible and desirable goal, and if so, um, why or why not? Yeah. So if anyone would like to chat in. <laughs> uh, I'll start out by maybe talking about what I think the opposite of the other panelists will say, which is that I, I don't think it's feasible with the the kind of the existing mentality that 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 uh, that's around, um, particularly around consumption. Um, so at Alaska, we we grow food indoors, uh, and we grow in urban contexts um, for communities. And um, it's always um, it's quite eye opening when you talk to the consumer. They have a lot of uh, opinions about how food should be grown, and then you ask them, "Hey, do you want to grow your own food?" And, and nobody wants to do it. And so we have a very strong opinion of how certain things should happen. Um, and we have a lot of philosophical debates about what, you know, how we should be in balance with nature. But then when you, when you kind of flip the table and saying, okay, how about you be, instead of being on the consumption side all the time, you'd be on the production side. Uh, and even given the promise of, of maintaining their existing salary, um, almost nobody says yes to this. Um, this is related to, to stigma um, or, or to um, maybe kind of some archaic understanding of what farming looks like today. Um, but typically it's, uh, you know, kind of given the fact that the, the, the imbalance of, of kind of producer to consumer, even just the ratio of number of people, for example, where the number of producers is, are, 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 are really diminishing and the number of consumers is every day, every day is expanding. Um, just kind of given the dynamic, it's, it's becoming less and less feasible. Um, and the other thing is that uh, we all as consumers have to be willing to pay more. And this is typically not something that consumers are willing to do. Um, and so this is one of the big challenges is how do we, uh, it's, it's the kind of the same uh, debate that you sometimes see in the apparel industry, where it's like, are you willing to pay more for clothes that isn't, grown, that isn't made in a sweatshop, for example? And most people are not really thinking about these things when they make purchases, to be honest. It's really, they're just like at cold storage buying stuff or they're at Far East Plaza buying stuff. Um, 
And kind of like within this context where these things are kind of out of sight, out of mind, it, it's very difficult um, to, uh, to really kind of think about the feasibility of, of food sovereignty. Um, I think maybe uh, the, some of the debates that we have internally within our company is, is kind of like given the current dynamics and assuming that maybe consu consumers, maybe almost a little bit cynically, won't change fast enough. Um, what are the things that we can do in the absence of this change in behavior that can still um, allow you know, urban citizens to have access to healthy, fresh produce um, you know, without really impacting their daily lives. Um, yeah, sorry. Can I, Stuart, I, I understand where you're coming from. At the end of the day, right, I think if you look at how politics has evolved, you realize that the basic needs and basic necessities of the citizens are political as well. So every country in the world has to ensure or every politician in the world has to ensure that their, their citizens are provided, uh, food is provided for them. If you look at every nation in the world, you realize that food subsidies have always existed to ensure that every citizen is provided the basic necessity, almost every nation. The farmers get grants and subsidies to ensure that the food that comes to the plate of every citizen is as cheap as possible so that that becomes a reality of what it is around the world. So if you go anywhere in the world, even in Singapore, right, to ensure that we get 90% of our food in our table, it's also a political decision. So commercialization and politics are always all intertwined in reality. So to understand food sovereignty, you need to look at the political lens of everyone else that looks at food very differently as well. If you go to any other country in the world, India, for example, there are 600 million farmers and every politician rules these farmers for votes because they're given subsidies and grants and given vote money to then basically vote for the politician, politician in power. Same as in Malaysia, same as in every other Southeast Asian countries. The, the people who produce food are political digits as well. So essentially, to ensure that food is made available in an affordable price is a political decision at the same time. I mean, one thing I would add to that is that you're talking about democracies. Um, so people where, where farmers are also voters, um, which, which I also agree. And so there's a lot of requirements to make sure that the producers are part of, that they're at least on the voting cycles of the election cycles, that they're being taken care of. Um, I, I definitely agree. Um, having said that, if you just look at kind of the number of farmers that we're losing overall, just the, even just in China where I'm calling in from today, um, over the next five years, we're projected to lose hundred million farmers, um, you know, just from urbanization, not from anything else besides people moving to cities. Uh, and this is happening all over the emerging markets. Uh, and so when I look at kind of the imbalance that's projected um, where we're projected to lose a half a billion farmers over the next 10 to 15 years across emerging markets, um, and, you know, a lot of this, this dynamic between like the, previously, let's say, empowered voter farmers, this huge important voting block um, is dwindling. Um, and it's dwindling from, from a GDP perspective. Um, the percent of GDP of China in, in, from, from agriculture is to be very, like, pretty high double digits, and now it's less than 2%. And so from an economic perspective, it's also being, um, it's become, becoming a, a little bit less important from a, from a political and a geopolitical perspective. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I think from a, uh, from a theoretical perspective and a philosophical perspective, I, I think we're all talking about the same thing. I think just from me, from, from being in a operating, you know, over the past uh, eight years in emerging markets, just from a, a practical perspective on the ground, some of the, um, yeah, I see some, some challenges in, in kind of moving consumer behavior quick enough to make things like food sovereignty uh, feasible in, in all the countries. Um, I think that, that point about different political systems is really important. And that's one of the things about producing yourself. So like Stuart's point about asking farmers, people to, to farm themselves, and, and, and people are like, you know, not that interested, is one of the starting points. If we, if we have a sense of how food production should look like in the world, and we cannot find a way to do that closer to us, how are we even going to say how it should be done somewhere else, much further away? So I think work, there's many, many different layers through which to think about food sovereignty. But one of this thing, these things I keep coming back to is that we can't really say much about the outer world or other people in cultures we cannot understand in political systems for whom, which are facing so many different layers of difficulty. If we cannot find a way to do that ourselves, 
but we have to start doing it ourselves while also being aware of what's happening outside. So for instance, in India now, there's massive farmer protests and that's happening because the farmers have found some way through many, many generations of working together to fight for a kind of sovereignty on their own terms. They have a sense of what they need, what the political system is putting against them and they have a clear sense of what could shape a better world for them. We don't have that in Singapore because we don't understand what feeds us, which in the long term is going to hurt other parts of Southeast Asia. And that's actually a really, that would be a point from, for which for us to think about what does food sovereignty look like in Singapore if we think about the region? Because the region, we live in the region with wind and water and everything and haze. So that would be a, a really like a, a point to start from that is both local, like what can we grow here, but then also regional, what can be grown elsewhere and what do our investments do elsewhere? No, it is a fact that we don't have a farming community, full stop. So if we don't have a farming community, there's no succession plan, there's no succession planning in farming in Singapore, honestly. We're starting from scratch, literally, right? And this 20 by 30 uh, mandate came about only about what, three, four years ago. Uh, before, prior to that, there was no mandate. No one talked about farming the way it's been spoken about now. Uh, so the reality is that we're literally in Singapore's context, we're starting from scratch. This is a nouveau sector, it's completely new. And many of the, the IHLs and everyone else in, in the universities and the polytechnics and the ITEs have never talked about farming in any of the curriculum whatsoever. So it's coming about now because everyone suddenly feels that this is the mandate that's been put out and everyone's challenged by this 2030 notion that we need to find food resilience, food sustainability and food uh, security somewhere along the way. It is to me a political, political need as well, but I think the reality is, is beyond that political need. It becomes a reality that what we is talking about with regards to connecting with nature and trying to understand where your food really comes from. I understand where Stuart comes from because I think it's a lot to do with technology and technology does play a part in this. Uh, but the reality is that we need to find a balance between technology and the reality of connecting with food. And I think food sovereignty to me is about trying to find that real balance between just not, not necessarily going into an indoor environment, but also not everything can be grown indoors for reality in, 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 in reality, right? So there's a little bit more of the outdoors as well. We need to find that balance that actually allows us to connect with nature and to understand where food comes from. Uh, regardless of whether you're going to do indoors or robots or the whole AI manages your food farm. But the AI will never manage your food farm unless the farmer or the guy who goes in to understand, who does not understand how food is produced, if he doesn't understand how food, how food is produced, he goes into, into a farm, into a plant factory, right? You will be a little bit more hard pressed to understand the technicalities of it as well. So I think we need to find that balance of trying to really reconnect with nature and use nature still as a, as a, as a, as a starting block to then re and then take that along a line where we have got different options of going into a completely indoor environment, agri-tech, or if not still soil-based and connecting with soils as well. And I think we need to find that balance in my opinion. Right. So again, another one of those situations where I feel like I have so many ideas like just popping and I feel like the panelists also probably are just at this point where there's just so many ideas. Um, I think we could go on and on about like soil-based versus tech-based farming. And in fact, that is one of the panels that I know is uh, coming up. It's the last panel, I think, not today, um, but there will be a discussion. Even if, if anyone's interested, um, please stay tuned for like the last panel, um, which is I think in a while, but not today. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think we want to dwell on that too much today, but um, what is emerging is, of course, like, I think this sense across the board, across our panelists, that food sovereignty, um, or at least some of the ideals within it, um, in terms of reconnecting with our food, um, having more control over our food systems and our food supply chain, um, having a greater stake in our food systems and producing our food. These things are important, especially in a Singapore context as well. So bearing this in mind, um, you know, I would like to kind of move the panel discussion into 
um, grounding in Singapore, how can we sort of move towards these ideals? Um, practically, what, what kind of steps um, do we need to take? What are the challenges that we foresee? Um, Stuart already mentioned one of them being people actually just don't want to farm. Um, I would love to hear more about this on a Singapore perspective if any of the panelists have more of an um, idea of what that looks like. Um, yeah, so just thinking about the practicality of bringing about that vision within Singapore um, and also hearing a bit more about the 30 by 30 um, would also be interesting in this context. So any of the panelists, feel free to jump in. Um, yeah. Hui Ying, do you want to start since you unmuted yourself? <laughs> I, yeah, I've been unmuted for a while. Um, uh, yeah, I would... I actually would be interested to ask like one of the other panelists, maybe after I should do a bit of sharing, but um, what, what kinds of, um, like we talk a lot about technology, but when you think about the signs of growing, there's many, many things that do not translate directly into a tech solution. And that's something I would like to hear from the other panelists. I'm sure you all have really interesting perspectives. Um, from the education side, from the like the commerce side, and I think those are really important points. Um, some of the challenges about, I think, growing locally that that many people put up, and I'm sure Stuart and Vera and Dr. Wilson all have points on this, is that um, so I have worked with Foodscape Collective for since 2015, March 2015, and we started as a community initiative. At that point, Edible Garden City was starting to do its like uh, sharings and workshops and how myself and some others met was through some of these workshops but and at that point Edible Garden City was seen as this you know like slightly fringe hippie bourgeois kind of thing and that's also one of the things to, to talk about like what where is inclusivity and diversity in this discussion about food sovereignty who actually gets to have this discussion and who actually needs these foods but cannot pay for some of the things that might be sold in supermarkets. So anyway, coming back to this story, Foodscape Collective, when we started, was just people who were trying to ask questions about how to grow your own food. And many of the things we faced over the years, um, which like recurring things that keep coming up when you talk to someone about why can't you grow your own food or can we grow food, um, is people would say there's not enough land, um, it's too hot, young people don't want to do this, it, it makes no money, which, realistically speaking, is true. Like, there is very little land, it is very hot, it's going to get hotter as well. It doesn't make a lot of money, which is a political economic question that Vera has alluded to already. And uh, what's the last thing? Young people don't want to do it. So, these are four things that people keep coming back to, and not all of them always have to stay the, the, the case. Like, reality is what we make of it. And I think one of the things I really enjoy about this panel is that it's organized by a student group who is asking these questions. And um, if we don't start asking these questions now, actually, it's already a bit late to start asking these questions, but there is a coming generation that can offer some other perspective on that. And that's something I really, really look forward to showing, seeing how that younger generation can show the older ones who have this Im image of things that cannot be done, given the kind of luxuries of the past 50 years after World War II. That's something I would really look forward to hearing and seeing. But um, yeah, so I also have questions for the other panelists about, about um, growing and some of the challenges of doing that. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing that I'll say um, is at Aleska, our vision is to democratize access to fresh and nutritious food by democratizing the means and the knowledge of production. And uh, we do this by using technology because the only way to really democratize knowledge is to have something that's, that's scalable, that's low cost or low friction, and that it can be adopted by anybody. Um, and just to kind of give you one example um, of what we view kind of what food sovereignty might look like in the future, um, one of our most recent hires um, was a cleaning lady in our office complex. And within the first two months, she smashed all of our growing records in terms of how fast she was able to grow um, edible flowers inside of our indoor farm. And, and that's what food sovereignty looks like to us, is that somebody that has no 
for example, she has no high school education, she can barely read, and she can grow better than any of us that have been growing for eight years in this indoor context. And even some of the, co the commercial farmers that we've been working with for 20, that have 20 years of experience, she's able to beat them. And to us, that's what technology enables, which is exciting for us. And she's, she's aided by so many things that are software and hardware and IoT driven that she only really has to focus on um, a core value added portion of the production stage that allows her to have like this superhuman ability to grow. And so what's really exciting for us is we also understand, even from a commercial perspective, like growing rice and maize and soybean in an indoor farm would be like the biggest commercial failure on planet Earth, at least at current prices and the way that we currently grow. But what's exciting is that we can already start adding value to what it is that we consume a lot of that, you know, we'd like to stop importing and exporting. Um, so things that are high in water content, for example, like shipping these things, um, we view romaine, we, we view like iceberg lettuce as essentially a ball of water that you're moving in a form that's that's perishable, damageable, and has a has a shelf life. You know, this is crazy. Like it's like moving bottled water that has a shelf life. And you know, these are kind of things that make sense to start replacing, to start growing locally and stop moving across borders, putting them on boats, putting them on airplanes to get to some some consumer somewhere else. And what's exciting is that technology is taking kind of these baby steps, but they're the the growth is exponential. So if you look at for example, alternative proteins, the cost of one kg used to be about $150,000 just probably five to six years ago. And now we're talking about under $50. And with our, our own indoor farm, um, we've doubled our capital efficiency every year for the past seven years. So we can grow with the same dollar that we invest in capital expenditure today, we can grow um, 160 times more food than we did seven years ago. And what's exciting is that when we talk about kind of the trajectory of what technology enables, um, and given the fact that we're not going to be able to tell people to not move to the city, uh, that we're not going to be able to tell them that, you know, they, 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 they must become farmers, that we're not going to be able to force people to do certain things where they can't move freely or they're not, they're not able to choose their occupation freely. Um, in a world where these are things where people have a free will to choose, um, you know, we also need to kind of have plan B, which technology plays a very strong and competent role in. And, you know, what's really exciting is that the technology is evolving so quickly that, you know, our goal, we've had, we've had elementary school kids run our indoor farm, and we've had individuals with mental disabilities and cognitive disabilities also run a commercial farm. And what's, what's exciting is that this is, without technology, in the absence of technology, um, it's very hard to imagine that these things would be possible. Um, but they're really, really becoming, you know, an everyday thing now and, and pretty commonplace. Uh, and so from that perspective, I think, from a food sovereignty perspective, technology plays not the only role. It's not something that will end all these debates and discussions, but it'll be something that will be a material contributor to future discussions about food sovereignty. Uh, Hui, sorry, uh, can, can I add on, you, you mentioned bourgeoisie, food, which is bourgeois. And, and then on the other, on the other side, uh, Stuart mentioned something about edible flowers, right? So I'm, I'm I'm trying to reconcile this fact about bourgeois food and edible flowers on the same in the same topic that you're talking about. I mean, honestly, right? I mean, edible flowers are used by Michelin chefs in trying to garnish their food. Uh, I'm not sure where the nutritional value of edible flowers would be in some of these food that's produced. On the other hand, when you talked about bourgeois food, which is unattainable or even with not within the reach of the, the heartlanders in Singapore which probably would be like very expensive kale or any other iceberg lettuce or anything else that's imported that actually has been coming into our pots, right? Uh, into our supermarkets where it's very, very expensive to go and buy a pundit of lettuce that's about $4.50 for about a few hundred grams, which is very, very, very Western in its nature as well, right? Which is not, has very little nutritional value, honestly, right? So then how would you reconcile this fact that, you know, then you are, trying to bring in food which doesn't have any nutritional value that's going to add on to the local population or the Asian culture that we're talking about in terms of food types. The food types that we've been used to, which are actually literally nutritional food that's been grown for generations in this part of the world in an Asian culture, which has now been infiltrated by Western kind of foods, which is bourgeois, which is actually coming from don't know God knows where. And you wouldn't have farms growing food types that are actually not necessarily the food types that's actually part of our cultural palate. So in, in my opinion, I think we should then relook this and say that we should start looking back and revisiting 
the fact that we try to go back to heritage foods that we are able to use and to find nutritional value for. And I think this is one of the conversations that we had. I think Wilson will, will also chime in as well, right? Why can't we go back to some of these food types? We can actually grow some of this. I've been doing indoor farm for the past 10 years. Uh, I, have a, I have a project that's growing in terms of nanoponic technology that can produce 2,000 tons per month very easily on a footprint, which is half a square, half, uh, it's about 5,000 5, square meters of land. The, I'm, I'm just working and developing this whole project, right? And I'm also looking at this whole situation where I can go to AI technology, farm technology, but I'm telling the investors that are coming in together with me, right? We're not going to produce lettuce. That's not our full type. We need to produce food types that actually is, which is part of our heritage and cultural value with nutritional value that's going to make a difference to the majority of the population in Singapore, which is a lot more affordable, right? I think, I think this conversation needs to be really looked at in terms of that context and not uh, in, I've done edible flowers and I, I will tell you, right? Yes, they, they are valued by the Michelin chefs, but really if you go down to the uncles and aunties and ask them, right? If you go into a food marketplace, into, into any hawker's place, right? Who uses edible flowers in our food types? Actually, none. Not a single one uses edible flowers in our food types. It's a Western culture, right? In that sense, it's a Michelin chefs, a garnish and all that. But in terms of nutritional value of real food that our, our culture uses, I think we need to revisit that and try and find value propositions on how to produce this food in as many ways as possible to make it affordable to as many people as possible. And I think, I, sorry, I, I, I might come across as a little bit more activist, but I, I really feel that that's, that's how we should actually go, go about looking at it. If I could just say one thing, okay, so the edible flower really is an example of taking something complex to grow and having somebody has no experience to be able to grow it. So the majority of food that we grow is nutrient dense, first of all. So a lot of the products that we're growing are high in vitamin K, for example. So these are like products that are consumed um, to... Um, you know, really to ease some of the early onset uh, symptoms of diabetes, for example. And so we're always focusing on fruit that's fresh. Um, typically, our products have three to four times higher vitamin C than what you find at the supermarket. So really, our focus is on, on nutrition. Um, we're not growing edible flowers all the time. It really is about um, showing that what the extent of the technology can do. So in the absence of any experience that you're a complete blank slate, that what it is that you're able to do on day one, essentially, when you're guided by technology, um, is, is really kind of the point of that story. So, you know, we're not focused on growing edible flowers all day long and selling to mission star chefs around the world. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is that, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so the other thing that we're also trying to do is to, to reduce the amount of imports. So we're trying to replace the imports. So um, instead of competing against local farmers that are growing the heritage foods, we're trying to find ways in which we can reduce the amount of food that's coming in. And so these are things that make commercial sense today. Um, and you know, as the technology scales and improves over time, we can then move on to products that are more um, local and more heritage, for example. Um, and so it's not so much that we have no intentions of growing food that is you know, more, cons more, in terms of volume, consumed more locally. Um, the idea is that as a business, we have to start somewhere. And so you know, same with Tesla, they started with a roaster that only Hollywood celebrities could afford. And now they're selling cars that more um, kind of like medium income households are able to afford. And just like any new technology, it'll take probably three phases to be able to be mass market adoption. And same with indoor farming or ag tech, it's the same trajectory. So right now we're still in phase one, things are expensive. We're growing things that may be less nutritious, but highly commercially valuable. It's maybe not applicable to everybody, but the idea is that we're starting somewhere where kind of like low volume, high margin gets you to medium volume, Um, and we're still kind of in everybody in the industry globally is still in phase one. I agree with that. I would love to get Wilson's view on this. Actually, I'm waiting to talk. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, I'll just say from the Singapore's perspective, I would say um, Singapore is again, I say we are a small country. Um, we do have acres and hectares of land uh, to farm, right? Uh, for years, I've been hearing people suggesting, why don't you uh, farm on the rooftops and all that. 
So therefore, I say technology has a very big part to play. Um, nowadays, LED technology and whatnot has become affordable and quite advanced. And hence, um, there comes where you can have indoor farms in underutilized spaces, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure some time back, we heard Edible Garden City doing out a container farm under one of the viaducts, right? There's one place. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, and I saw that um, HDB void decks are now having some community gardens having hydroponic sets being set up. So these are actually big strides, I would say, uh, in the advancement of using such, such spaces to grow things. Okay, so of course, um, whoever who runs an indoor farm will know that the cost is very high in Singapore. So as a result, no choice. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the farmers who are doing indoor farms would resort to growing um, niche market edibles, right? Your edible flowers, your ice plant, um, baby spinach, specialty lettuce and whatnot. Okay, and selling to a small group of restaurant owners who, who have Michelin chefs who can afford it. So therefore they can survive. So the question often I ask is that, why don't you, I mean, a very innocent question I often ask is, why don't you grow chai sim at Galan? They say, I can't, I can't beat the Malaysian prices. I can't beat the Chinese prices, you know, the imports that are coming in. So this is a question. That's why people ask this question, whether indoor farms have a, have a part to play, you know, towards uh, food, food security in Singapore. I personally believe so, because we're still learning. Um, indoor farm is totally a artificial environment, I must say, okay? So as humans, I think we have still yet to understand what nature really wants, what our plants really want. And people who just bring plants in and grow indoors um, often have a lot of issues that we don't quite understand what is happening. Right? So there's a lot of understanding to do because this is a backup. In one, one day when climate change really comes to us, really when no land, you're polluted land, polluted water and whatnot, probably indoor is the place to go, right? And Starting in uh, nowadays, a lot of people are starting indoors. I mean, homeowners is, is the part to start, is to let them understand so that one day maybe our young children will want to be farmers. So that's one thing. Then coming out to outdoors, right? Um, the question here I always ask myself is that do all the in other plants, like what Vera said, who, which may not make up our usual pellet of food here, have a place? in our outdoor gardens, especially now uh, bring another topic, okay, that is climate change, right? There is climate change proof ready. They can, they can survive on less water. They can grow in poor soils and all that, all right? And then also talking about our native plants, right? Uh, they may not taste as good. You no, know, they come from our forests and all that. They may not, they, they, they have a story on their own eaten by the, by the tribes, you know, but not eaten by us modern uh, civilians uh, in urban context. So this is a question that I always ask is that, you know, are we ready to grow, uh, eat those things? A lot of them are already planted in our parks and gardens and streetscape, you know, uh, that a lot of people will be wondering, can you eat it? And maybe they say it's not nice to eat, all right? But we need to know how to cook them. And more importantly is that to reconnect to our roots, to get to know, you know, our ancestors and food brings people together, right? So um, we can have various people from various backgrounds and, you know, bringing food together and get to know each other better and bring people closer together, especially during these COVID times where uh, isolation is still safer than getting together, you see. So I have raised a few more things to, to talk about. So those plants that I talked about that may be primate, climate change proof uh, might not be something that we, we, we are accustomed to, not your chai sim, your kailan and your kangkong, right? But are we ready to eat it? Are we really ready to embrace it? It's a sovereignty to someone else, but not to us. And then coming to our usual edibles that we always eat, uh, they have been bred for agriculture, right? In such a way whereby now they really need us to take care of them to grow, right? So that uh, we get consistent yield and people pay for their food. So they want beautiful, wholesome, um, blemish-free food, right? So. Are we ready for that? Do we have the resources to take care of those things that we are familiar with? Yeah. Um, I think what Wilson brings up is really important. It brings in also this element of what is like social, social psychological health for communities. And this thing about blemished foods, cultural foods, and climate change, I think it comes together a lot when we think about how, do you, how does the food system, when we think about 
what is, you know, so, so much of this goes into how can we produce the most amount of food for people. But there's also this element, which is that food sustains a cultural spirit in us, uh, connecting with people, but also in understanding our roots, like our cultural connections with different groups of people. And I think what Wilson brings up is that food sovereignty, even if we think about it in Singapore as an urban context, it's not just about, oh, how much are we importing? How much are we exporting? How much is produced here? But what is the cultural and historical element? Like how do those things twine together? And actually I would say that this is in a way, I would say it's more important, this, this question, than how can we produce the most amount of food for everyone? Because if we bring in this cultural aspect, we start to address many, many things, which is um, things to do with uh, respect, um, empowerment, empowerment of the self and of each other. We start to listen better. We start to try to hear what is beneath the words that people say. So all these things about mutual respect come in and that's one of the things I was um, thinking along when I was talking about communication. Uh, I think climate change brings up other issues like crisis and death and disaster and eco-anxiety, which is really difficult to think through. It creates a lot of um, anger as well. And people start to become more conflict avoidant and conflict approaching, you know, like they want to go to it. So it's really important to think about how we create these spaces of, um, yeah, like trying to trying to create points of health. And, and on, one, on that point, I would also say that there are many, many uh, native species. Wait, I wouldn't use the word native, but I would say um, species of food that are used as, uh, that have been used by people who came before which are not seen in global commodity chains because they're not known as modern, that pr provide a lot of, uh, they are medicinal and they offer something else that our emotional and also physical body needs. And many of these things can be found through things like Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicines, many, many different forms, um, indigenous medicines, which all have that. And that is the, the connection that we can find with food sovereignty as a movement across the world, even if many Singaporeans no longer have someone in their family who has produced food or has that kind of connection. I think this is a kind of like much larger human solidarity that we need to find. Um, and yeah, I think we really need to work towards that. Yeah. You know, I was introduced to anthropological food palettes by Nitya herself. <laughs> She's a food anthropologist, right? And I was very, very happy to meet her because her passion for what she spoke about with regards to the Asian cultural heritage of food types, which have got really very, very deep emotional connections. And Singapore being multicultural, multiracial, the food diversity that we have is almost not practiced many other places in the world, honestly, really, right? Because of the, the, the diversity that we have in our culture, and our food types are actually very, very emotionally connected, not necessarily with familial also, but also because of culture, religion, and other specs as well, which is very much Asia, honestly. So the food palette, as long as the food palette that we have and the food production and the food palettes are still connecting back to our heritage values, and I think it's important for us to recognize that and to ensure that the food types that we grow are still literally connecting us back to that heritage value. And anthropologically, I think the Asian culture is very different from the Western culture as well, because our food types are in terms of even geogra geography, right? Cannot be grown in that part of the world. And they're beginning to appreciate our food types now as well, because they now, we can now expect some of, export some of our food types to the Western cultures. And we have been importing a lot of the Western food into the Eastern culture as well, which is basically what we are beginning to do now, what we see in the supermarkets. So the, my biggest fear is that the dilution of our heritage value and our cultural as well as our anthropological values of our food palates would be diluted at some point. And I think the dilution also leads to the fact that we will lose our sovereignty of food types that we have been used to as well. 
But I think the bigger, the bigger discussion is how do we then manage and maintain this? And I also I take cognizance from Wilson's viewpoint that you know we are short, we definitely as Singapore, Singapore is short of land, but there are marginalized land that's actually literally everywhere in Singapore that could be used for other purposes as well. And there are obviously a lot of indoor facilities, indoor warehouses that could be used for growing different kinds of food types as well. And it's not that it's at, the, at this present moment, indoor or controlled environment agriculture, not a single, as, as, as I know, Stuart, please correct me if I'm wrong, but not a single company in the world has made it economically viable to ensure that, that whatever production that goes out in your indoor environment, indoor farm is economically viable. Many of the companies that I've known in the last 10 years who started this uh, from farm one to uh, aero farms to everyone who's gone to series E funding have not produced, have not been able to show in their books that they are viable at this point in time, honestly, right? So you're right. I think we are just start of that whole journey. Uh, my, my view is that if we can use that technology that's being developed, then ensure that the, the anthropological food types or the heritage food types are also still relevant for our population and our culture, then we should actually pursue that uh, as much as possible going forward. Um, could I just step in really quickly? Um, so I want to say that what we're talking here is also uh, very much in the Singapore context and the future of the food landscape. So Singapore is both Eastern and Western, um, you know, and I don't think we can ask anyone in the next 10, 15 years to eat exclusively traditional foods. Uh, they're still going to want their lettuce and their kale, um, but it's how do you balance, right? It's the meat and vegetarian argument. Do you go fully vegan? Is that better for the environment or is it better to eat 20% meat but from regenerative meat sources? What is better? So it's about finding balance and the sources of where that food is coming from. Uh, I also want to say, you know, we also live in the times of Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok. So everyone wants their food pictures to look good. Uh, so edible flowers are, and continue, are going to continue to be the most superficial rage as we move forward. But maybe instead of like tasteless pansy flowers, we use Ulam Raja flowers, we use Moringa flowers, we use marigold flowers which work in our climate and resonate in our traditions and have medicinal properties. So I think what we're really looking here with you guys, you know, like you're all iconic in your own ways in the work that you're doing. So what is this balance that we can achieve moving forward, right? Is it possible to grow heritage varieties indoors? Is it possible to, that all farms are a mix of both? And I think it's this other question that Huang mentioned was when she said like Egypt's Edible Garden City being seen as this, you know, group of bourgeoisies, you know, like university students trying to find themselves joining. Um, is it, is food sovereignty and farming a, one for people who are privileged, who have time, access, and don't need to earn money, um, don't need to support themselves or you know, is that what's happening and how can we change that or just do we have to accept it? Uh, so I think that's it'd be nice if you guys can talk about this uh, moving forward for the next few minutes before we open the Q&A. Hmm? Well, I can start. Um, yeah, it opens like a huge number of questions, right? This thing about, um, are we here because we are privileged enough that we can talk about this question of food sovereignty when many people cannot have that conversation? Um, I think it's good to recognize that, yes, we are here because we have the time. We can actually talk about these things. But then also not kind of get ourselves caught in this thing about, oh, we are more privileged, therefore, it's um, something that we just like, have to find some way to push away. But rather say that if we, are, if we are privileged enough to have this time to think about these issues, we have that responsibility, responsibility to think about the ones who are not at this table and who actually need to be at this table as well in order to make these discussions more diverse that can respond to the many different things that will come up. This thing about climate change actually brings up the point about needing many diverse sources of food. Um, so biodiverse landscapes and also biodiverse 
more diverse seed sources along with the knowledge that's needed to kind of propagate these plants. And I think like Dr. Wilson will have more to say about that. Um, I think what I want to say is that this aspect of community, it's not like we have one community, we have many, many fragmented communities right now actually. And the important thing to do is to find ways to bring these communities together without centralizing them. But so to build a position of strength to, to which they can be seen as consumers that have a kind of consumers and producers that are able to tap out of systems they don't agree with, which include state-centric systems and also systems which are actually artificially maintained. I think Vera was kind of pointing to that. We have many food production systems. We have a global food production system now, which is maintained by government subsidies. The EU, well, I'm based in the EU now, and I'm realizing that the EU is one very, very big source of this. The EU protects its farmers to different extents at the expense of everything that's outside the EU. So there are many of these things where food production is not even actually economically viable. It's maintained by investor funding and state funding, but then the people who actually know that there's something going on in my land and I'm getting the worst of the health effects are not at the table to have any discussion, um, any decision-making power. So I think this part about finding each other, maintaining connection is really important. And um, yeah, I hope I answered the question that Nithya raised. If I could just add one, um... A couple of things. I don't want to sound like Alaska is like this evil corporation focused on growing flowers. Um, one thing that I'll say about climate change is that everybody talks about it like it's an environmental issue. Uh, and it's actually a social issue because whoever's on this call right now isn't going to be paying the price for climate change. Anybody that's in air conditioning right now is not going to pay the price for climate change. So um, if you really think about it, the people that are that are not at this table, not talking about food sovereignty, are the ones that are going to feel the, the direct impact of climate change. And so, from that perspective, um, you know, if there's a way that technology can alleviate some of these challenges with access to healthy, nutritious food, then kind of like any tool in the shed is worth using. Um, and so, um, I won't exclude the use of GMOs if there's a, an opportunity for that to make a big impact uh, in regions that are going to be struck by climate change. Um, and I would say that one thing about technology, and, and for example, indoor farming as, as an example, is that the analogy for, from our company's perspective is that the transportation industry is super efficient because there's so many different modes of transportation. You, you could literally walk um, or ride, ride a bicycle. You can ride a car, a bus, an airplane, a rocket ship. There's just so many different ways to move people and goods that each one hyper-specializes in what it's good at. So if you're going to go transatlantic, you have an airplane, or maybe you can use a rocket. But if you're gonna go across the city, maybe it's a bus, maybe it's a car, maybe you ride a bicycle. And with the way in which we grow food, there isn't that much diversity in the ways in which we grow food. And the exciting thing for us um, at Alaska is that indoor farming is almost like a new mode of, tra of transportation, but from the context of food production. So it'll, as indoor farming becomes more profitable and more efficient, it allows the other forms, whether it's greenhouses or more conventional field farms, to specialize in crops that are more, um, either economically viable or more suited to those environments. So what's exciting for us is that by adding this new mode of production, um, we're not saying it's gonna solve world hunger. We're not saying that it's gonna solve food security or food sovereignty issues. It's one of the many important tools in the shed that eventually will allow the overall global food supply chain to become more efficient. And so the promise of that is driven by kind of the convergence of a lot of different types of technology, whether it's on the software side or the hardware side, making things more affordable and more profitable. And so, you know, what's exciting is that indoor farming isn't restricted to niche forever, just like if you thought about kind of like whether it's, you know, you know, aerospace was something that was done by governments 20 years ago. Now it's done by mostly by by most of the launches are done by private corporations now. Um, and if you look at battery electric vehicles, a lot of these things were subsidy driven. Now, like companies are becoming mature and are being weaned off of, of these subsidies and agricultural technology and, and let's say indoor farming as an example or precision ag these kinds of tools and solutions are, are also kind of on that same trajectory. And it will become just one of many solutions uh, for um, you know, cities and communities around the world to use as a way of, let's say, ensuring, let's say 10% of all the nutrition that you need or 30% that you need um, at all times is guaranteed. Um, one of the few ways to be able to do that is to have a way that you can control the climate. So this might be indoor farming. And so 
um, really for us, it's not really about replacing, it's really about being complementary. You know, cities are gonna get more dense. We can't stop that. These are macro trends that are never gonna change. You know, um, young kids, as they like fly around the world, um, you know, they're gonna be exposed to different cultures. They're gonna wanna eat that in their own home communities. Um, and so they're not gonna just eat their locally available food. They're gonna want to be able to eat these salads and these, these different things that they experienced abroad. And so what's exciting is that indoor farming or ag tech in general has an opportunity to provide those options in ways that are both economically and environmentally feasible. Cool. Okay. <laughs> um, I feel like we, get, like we have so much things to think about. Um, yeah, I think a part of the issue here, right, is that we are looking at food sovereignty as sort of like a, I don't want to say a cure-all, but like almost like it's trying to do a lot of things right now. And I think what we envision food sovereignty to be like we individually or, you know, even collectively, I think we have a lot of agendas within this food sovereignty. And, and what we're trying to do is like, we're trying to produce as much food as possible to feed the masses. We're trying to make it accessible. We're trying to solve some sort of like disconnect between like urban citizens and their food sources. We're trying to uh, mitigate climate change. Um, we're trying to meet some middle ground between the East and the West. There's a lot of things that I think food sovereignty can, um, can do and sometimes should do. Um, but I think for the purposes of a conversation, like, I think it's also not possible that Singapore, like I, I think one of the questions that, so moving into the Q&A a little bit, one of the questions that um, someone had was more about um, how it's, it's basically not possible for Singapore to achieve some sort of food sovereignty because, you know, of practical reasons. Um, and us producing our own food is just like impossible, or at least this wasn't asking. Um, and so without making all of us farmers like how or maybe that's the the, the answer right and so I'm, i guess i'm asking the the panelists like what is the answer to this question of like is it even possible for like us to to seek um false food sovereignty or are we trying to do too much and should we look for an alternative goal um or as hui mentioned before is this a regional question instead that we should be answering um, yeah, and so I think um, anyone can kind of just start, maybe like Dr. Wilson, if since we're spoken for a bit again. <laughs> so yeah, if you have any thoughts, Dr. Wilson, you can start. I think um, let's go for a hybrid. Okay, uh, I'm a very practical person. All right. Uh, like the many things that I mentioned just now, the constraints uh, that works for other people. We must remember that we have a lot of constraints. So a hybrid will be good. Um, personally, I just feel that uh, to take charge to have, uh, to have the experience, right? Um, there need then is a need uh, for Singaporeans to really experience the process of food production. Talking about plant-based foods. We have not gone on to uh, animal uh, husbandry, right? So if you talk about plant-based foods, right? Um, I always tell people that we start off as a gardener first, right? And we need To thinking about it, um, Huying has mentioned this many times. It's not just about the growing part of it, producing the biomass, but the growing aspect of things is that it is psychological, social, a lot of it. Okay, it, it, it nurtures the show, uh, the, the soul. Okay, uh, let us get back to nature, spend some time to get in touch with nature, play with soil, get to know plants, listen to the birds. It's therapeutic. Highly, highly therapeutic, right? Uh, so that's one thing. And also for us to be, um, to, to, to understand how nature plays a part in all these things. Because I'm pretty sure a lot of us now living in urban cities, we, we, we become disconnected with it. We have lost, um, you know, I have people who tell me they are afraid of bees. Uh, they're scared of lizards. They hate spiders. Uh, they don't like to see monitor lizards. What's wrong? You know, or, uh, we we should we should share that living space with them, right? They have a part to play when you start growing your own food, right? Hui Ying, when you do composting and all that, you know, all, all of them have a part to play, as opposed to 
well, uh, in indoor production context where everything should be sterile, as clean as possible, nothing is there. Uh, although people are using useful microbes and whatnot, right? So, so that is something I feel that um, people should start to take charge and, and, and they take charge by growing things. And probably there should be some ground up um, thinking here. One of the things that I always question here is that can Singaporeans work together as a, uh, as a group, as a community, as a estate group or whatever you call it, uh, although we have a residence network and whatnot here in our neighborhood estates, but authority saying that, look, I want to take over your whole entire green space in the neighborhood to produce food in an aesthetic, responsible, and biodiverse and ecological manner. In space, but it acts as an educational space, therapeutic space, at the end, productive and useful space for everybody. So this is something that I hope to be able to see. And then if you're able to grow your own food right at your doorstep, you may warranty actually, right? And not to mention, once you start to do all these kind of things, you realize how, how difficult it is to produce food. Then we don't have so much food waste. Food waste is a mammoth issue in Singapore. The authorities does a good job. Uh, but that shouldn't be the case, right? Huying, I think Foodscape Collective, you work with us uh, in Europe. We'll be wondering, oh, I didn't know food. We have so much. So these are, quite, uh, these are things that I wanted to share. Um, we can actually take control. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I chime in? Yeah, so sorry. Um, no, I, I, I tend to agree that, you know, we need to have a balance, right? So Wilson mentioned to ensure that technology is still relevant for food production. I've been one of the pioneers in indoor farming in Singapore for a long, long time. I started it 10 years ago, developing my own LED light. that are being devolved as well. So I've not put technology aside. I still am very forward thinking. I realize that and I know that technology has a part to play. So I'm developing completely new AI systems that actually will make a difference to how food is produced. But what I'm trying to say in kinds of food types, uh, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that, you know, the Asian culture and the connection with the food types is very important for us. We need to feed the population in Singapore, obviously. Uh, we need to make it affordable. We need to make sure that the food types that are available for the population and it reaches the, the, the poorest of the poor at an affordable price. And that to me, it's not about food sovereignty, but it's about food self-sufficiency. And I think we have to really They're not necessarily uh, dichotomous, they're not separate things. They need to be completely looked at together as well. Sustainability and sovereignty come together as one component part to me in my thinking. So technology does, has a, does have a part to play. Uh, and Wilson mentioned, right? I mean, no, we talked about food forests coming into parks. And I think trying to reconnect the population and as many people as possible to the food types that they grew for us to understand because technology will have the part to play to mitigate climate change issues. We can put sensors in. It is now a lot more advanced. I, I'm working with some people who are developing new microbes that are going to soils that actually can remediate soils as well. So to find a balance of naturally grown food types and completely an indoor environment that also possibly can use my How do you then ensure that the food types that are produced indoors could be actually as natural as possible with a microbial element with less NPK ratios, less inorganic fertilizers, and you into the microbiomes that actually would allow them to grow in an indoor environment. I think these technologies are beginning to evolve. And the way I, the way I see it, because I'm involved in some research with NUS and NTU in these areas, and I think it's possible to find this balance of trying to do 
population are grown possibly in an indoor environment, but making it making them as natural as possible if we can using organic elements. And then the other portion of trying to reconnect everyone else with nature and nature-based foods and nature-based solutions in, in an outdoor environment with technology as well. So regardless of whatever, whether it's uh, and natural production of food, I still feel that technology has got a part to play. And technology is important for us to go forward because that's literally what connects the younger generation to what we are going to be doing in the future as well. Growing food, not naturally with your hoe and chunkle and soils, but actually understanding them with technology, getting the data and using that data to connect with food uh, in man, as many different possibility ways, as many possible ways as possible. Uh, it's, I think, very important for us going forward. So jumping in really quickly um, and also being mindful of the time, we have around nine minutes and I kind of want to like <laughs> make sure we get to this question um, is really quickly if, if I guess the panelists can Barrier of food sovereignty, right? One of the questions that is most unvoted also on Slido um, is how can we, at the end of the day, make locally grown food accessible for the masses? Um, and I think we went into it a little bit in the whole tech versus soil based farming. It's also about um, how we can put in enact policies, how we can sort of create ground up um, initiatives and ground up communities that can make this happen so you know for the local for local Singaporeans um, especially lower income families um, for which this is very important um, yeah so anyone can start uh, I will start with something um, also just to say that yes I fully agree like companies are all bad that actually it's really important that people begin to be able to turn the work they do into value because then that allows them to sustain underpaid, it's not even valid. So I think that the question about technology and commercialization is that, and also how food sovereignty comes in, is that there needs to be a way to have decision-making power, but also the knowledge and the skill. And I think that's where like what Stuart's doing with the indoor farming, like where, where people can actually learn about it first and then they can start being interested in the large, much wider circuits. That's one of the ways that that kind of sovereignty forms over time. Um, sovereignty as a kind of knowledge structure. So one of the things about um, how communities can do this more and how actually this is where technology also does play a part. Um, one of the things that Foodscape Collective has done before and is still... Um, look it up. Uh, it's now evolved beyond just a web, a map. So we had an open source, crowdsourced uh, map that listed the different, there were different types of things people could do. It's all like place-based and you can go across the island to look for these spaces. And it was meant to be as open as possible to just generate this, help people find attract black gold and there's like a range of different things that you can look out for you just look for the website we'll, I think Tammy will drop the link afterwards but that's one example of how technology how the principles of inclusivity come in really well because then you're applying technology in a way that is designed so that more people can take part in that and shape that um, connection of food, material, land and resource and time I, I guess if I jump in here, one of um, Aleska's moonshots uh, is to make food free. Um, it's something that our team is, is committed to making possible within hopefully the next 20 years. Um, but the idea is here is, um, you know, just like public school education in most places is free of charge. Um, we want to require is completely a, a different way of, of thinking about food as a product um, and thinking of it maybe even almost like a service. Uh, and to be able to find the right partnerships that would allow And one of the easiest examples is one of the, the partnership discussions that we were having with MetLife in Singapore 
was to see if if somebody bought a dollar of high quality local fresh produce, can their premium on their health insurance and stuff, you get the rebate and effectively it's free. And we wanted to find ways in which the right partners with the right technology and the right business model could result in food that is affordable for anybody. Uh, and, and food becoming, there's kind of this huge local food production trend and also kind of a healthier eating or a plant-based eating trend. Uh, and as well as what the convergence of technology where food can literally be grown, you know, maybe underneath your feet. Um, and so what's really exciting for us and, and really as one of our big moonshots is, is to find a business model where that food um, can really become free. And what the, one of the ways this is being actually done on farms today is, you know, a lot of the farms that I visited um, for almost a year in Southern California, the strawberry farms and the organic farms, the food is actually free. You, all you have to do is pay for the tour. And so in that case, the food is the service. It's the entertainment. It's the education. Um, it's the content. And it's not really the actual physical good. And so by getting people to shift their mindset around what is food uh, and saying, hey, this is actually an educational thing for your family to enjoy, for your kids to learn as part of your, your curriculum, we can make that food um, be kind of the part of the content, which is given to the students at the end of the, the field trip. Um, and all they have to do is pay for the educational, the educational tour, essentially. And so one of the ways that we're trying to do this in the developing countries that we're in is to really find the right partnerships that allows us to do this very thing is, can we make food free? Like, can we just get somebody to pay for the value and the education that we're providing or the entertainment? It's almost like going to the movies and you get like a whole bag of groceries for free at the end of it. Um, and so what's exciting is that these things are, are kind of like already kind of on the cusp of happening. Uh, and so our team is very hopeful that, you know, before I retire from Aleska, that uh, we're going to accomplish one of these moonshots, which is really to make food free for, for everybody, whether they're your low income or whatever, um, whoever needs it um, can have it. Stuart, you should come and talk to me to try and make it happen in Singapore. We're already trying to do that in Singapore. We already started uh, virtual tours as well as educational uh, 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 workshops for schools and, and children as well. And yes, at the end of the day, they bring back something uh, with them. Uh, so I think, I think your, your question was a lot to do with also policies as well, uh, with Singapore policies. I think, I think it's, it's, the mandate is there to 30 by 2030. Uh, I think it's, it's still, we are actually only, only about nine years to reaching that target. Yeah, thereabouts, nine years. And I think the journey started probably about five years ago when Masago spoke about it, three, three, four years ago, five years ago when he started that journey, when he spoke about it. And up till now, we still have not even reached that more than 10, 15% of our self-sufficiency at this present moment. So it's, it's still a long haul, right? And we have been throwing money at every other company that comes our way and trying to get them to start an agri-tech facility in Singapore and trying to transfer knowledge uh, into one way or another. And I think that's one of the challenges that we're facing now, right? Uh, who do we give the money to? Who do we give grants and subsidies to? Whether those people who are coming and getting those farm plots, are, are they really able to Uh, journey as well. And I think one of the issues that I feel that needs to be addressed is the novelty journey. And you've got so many people putting up proposals and trying to build farms without anything in their lives. And then they have a small plot. And based on a small pilot project, they're given money in the, in the for Singapore. And I think that's all misplaced in my opinion. I think they need to identify the real individuals who are really passionate, the real individuals who can be, if possible, given an entrepreneurial opportunity to then take it forward. And I think you expertise. We need to bring in that domain expertise. Obviously, when you look at domain expertise, then you say that the technologies will come in and say that we don't need so much domain expertise, the technology will look after it. But I think we need to find that balance of domain expertise and technology to make this work for Singapore. Out there, the policymakers need to understand that and trying to find that balance of how we can actually bring this together and to make sure that we reach that target of 30 or if not more than 30, very quickly, very, as, as quickly as possible.
Dr. Wilson, do you want to round us off with your final comment? <laughs> Oh, you're muted. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I still listening. There's so many things to talk about. Um, as you can see that I come from a very different point of view, right, from the rest of everybody. What Vera has mentioned just now, um, Singapore is lacking in talent, uh, especially in growing things producing food, all right? No, two other people who actually, who is very interested in edibles and growing edibles. And those people who are horticulturists, who grow ornamental plants and trees, uh, are a very different breed from... So I think we have to start today. You know, uh, the young people here who are listening, if you are keen, I think you might want to link us up with some of the panelists here who might be keen to us into, into the future, really, because you can see that all of us here have different viewpoints. Huh? You see, Stuart is a high-tech farmer. Vera is a mix of both. I'm a community farmer, gardener, horticulturist. Hui Ying is talking about soil. Probably need to talk to all of us so that you can do something great. So I would say that uh, Nifia will tell you a little bit about um, cultural foods and plants and whatnot. Okay, she does very amazing things. So I hope that, you know, this session makes you think a little bit more about food sovereignty, where your food comes from, and how you can actually play a part. Okay, and you don't need to wait, you can start now, really. Okay, and Singapore is a unique Claims, our unique circumstances um, does not translate into easy solutions. Uh, you really need to think about innovative ways, combining what's in the past. Um, our roots, by yet embracing technology um, from all over, okay, to be able to do something great. All right, um, because really, uh, it will We not be um, relying our, our, our food sources and whatnot to outside um, sources. Uh, we have to take control. That's something I always firmly believe in because nowadays you can see how volatile the world has become. Okay, uh, COVID has really kind of like turned the world up. And geopolitical situations are also quite tricky. So I think some, uh, it's better to start where you are at home. Thanks everyone, um, and also everyone out there, I guess it's not just young people that the burden of this falls on, right? I think like anyone who is like interested in food issues, which is everyone, because everyone eats food, right? Everyone should be interested in having a stake in our food system, especially in Singapore, when we already have so little people, right? I think we need all hands on deck um, right now. Um, yeah, so I guess, oh, we have we have the screen up now. Um, yeah, so uh, this is this is everyone's uh, handles. Oh no, the screen should be, okay, it's back. Um, this is everyone's handles um, on Instagram. So if you would like to get in touch, um, as Dr. Wilson said, do get in touch with everyone to learn a bit more about every everything that we shared. And I think definitely today was the beginning of a lot more insights. And hopefully for people who are participating, it doesn't stop here. Um, yeah, you can just screenshot this really quickly before we move to the next slide. Um, oh, mine's Vera at Greenology.sg. Yes. <laughs> and then... Um, no, that's just the Instagram handle. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell everyone your email address, Vera. Come on. <laughs> Everyone's going to flood Vera with email very, now. very old, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so, so the next slide which you're going to um, is yes, yeah, so the next few um, panels will be a continuation of what's happening today. Um, of course, like today is the beginning of a lot of discussions um, and we haven't touched into the more cultural aspects of it. And so that's what the second panel will be about. Um, and it will be about putting, um, talking also to um, a few indigenous um, 
people. Um, and I think that's a very interesting perspective that we haven't seen much of um, in the food space in Singapore, unfortunately. Um, so yes, and I also know Xiao Yun, who is uh, the moderator for the session, um, and she's from Ground Up Initiative, which is also a great place to volunteer. So if anyone's interested, do go and get your hands dirty. Um, and then the final panel um, will be about the 30 by 30 goal, which we got into a bit today. Um, and it's a very big thing to talk about. Um, I think we can go on and on about the 30 by 30 goal, whether it's problematic, whether it will it's effective. You know, there's a lot of questions around this. And I think the last panel will really get into um, the details of that. This one is also uh, moderated by someone I know, Ben, um, who I'm sure will have a lot to share as well. Um, and I think the sessions will be very exciting. Um, and I hope to see everyone there. Um, and thank you to the panelists for um, being in this conversation today. And thank you for everyone's energies. Um, it was a very great discussion. Um, and I took a lot, I took away a lot from it. Um, yeah. And thank you everyone. Thank you Nidia as well for putting this together. No, I also want to thank the Yale and US team, Weilin, Jiamin, Marilyn, uh, who really made this happen as well. Uh, we're very excited where this is going. We just wanted to seed some ideas and have the conversation start and continue and grow. Uh, if you are looking for jobs after university, please message any of these people in this panel. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, expand your farming and food understanding. I'm sure they're going to feed you very delicious food along the way as well. So, yeah. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.